All right. Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, this is going to be a webinar on short butterflies and we're going to go into the short put butterfly in particular. But let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick. My name is Eric Wilkinson. Some of you guys may recognize me from CNBC, Fox Business, or the Wall Street Journal for my commentary on everything from economic to geopolitical and market analysis. I've been trading my own money for well over 20 years. I started out trading in college and uh, decided to move to Chicago and work at the Board of Trade. And in that whole time, I've traded everything from uh, stocks, financial futures, commodities, currencies, and options on all of these products in all market conditions. Uh, please keep in mind that everything that we talk about in these videos, in these webinars, is for informational purposes only. Any material provided by ProTrader Strategies and or associate companies or employees is not to be constituted as investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any of these securities or strategies. Uh, the reason why I can't sit there and tell you guys, hey, this is a great, uh, this is a great strategy to implement into your portfolio. Go put it in there today, or go buy this stock, or any of those things. You guys, I don't know your risk parameters. I don't know what's in your portfolios, and so what I'm doing could be ultimately counterintuitive to what you guys are already doing. So it's it's not financially responsible for me to tell you guys, hey, go out and do this. Some people do it. Uh, I've been in the business long enough that I know everybody has a different risk parameters and what's uh, what I'm doing isn't always good for everybody else. And please remember that past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. Yes, Pete is asking me if that is the Stanley Cup and it is the Stanley Cup. I did stop short as you can see there. I didn't actually... <laughs> A little worried about what I might get on my lips if I really kissed it. Uh, anyway, this is on a short put butterfly. And remember, you know, all of these strategies, some of them I like more than the others. Uh, this is one that actually works well in this type of environment. It doesn't always work well in any given environment. It works pretty good when there is uh, been a sideways trending market because in my eyes, uh, the, the trend isn't always going to be straight sideways. There's going to be violent moves up or down after that, what we call the, on the floor, it was like the rubber band, it felt like the rubber band was getting wound tighter and tighter and tighter the longer it stayed in a channel. And it's going to sooner or later snap out of that. So that's the kind of idea around this one. We don't really know necessarily which direction it's going to jump at, but Sooner or later, that rubber band's going to come unwound, and so this is going to take off in one direction or the other. All right. All right. So, like I said, this is market assumption. We want this market to move and move quickly. We want it to move outside the wings. Now, what are the wings? The wings are actually the two short strikes that we're going to have in this particular strategy, and those short strikes are one is going to be in the money when we first initiate the strategy and one of them is out of the money so the two at the monies are the long ones but we want it to we're going to start right there at the money and we want it to move quickly one direction or the other we don't really care what direction it goes but we want this thing to start moving almost at inception would be the best case scenario and uh, we want to risk one to make one. So in that regard, we're going to be collecting a credit for this. So if it's $5 wide, we want to get to as close to uh, $2.50 credit as we can. If it's $3 wide, then we are going to try and collect as close to $1.50. Uh, if you can collect over that, that is gravy is what I like to look at it as. But usually it's going to come in slightly under. But I have uh, found a couple examples that we can share today that will come in above that 50%, which is a uh, great scenario to have. So like I said, just to go over real quickly, we're going to be buying two at the money puts, selling one in the money put, and selling one 
out of the money put. And this is IRA appropriate. Thank you for asking. Uh, I'm being asked if this is IRA appropriate. Yes, it is uh, because it is a defined risk strategy. Uh, we have the two long puts to cover those two short puts that uh, are in this strategy. All right, then the keys to success. Six, the keys to success in this particular strategy. Picking the right underlying. Now this, uh, I, if you watch many of my webinars, I've kind of switched up these keys to success. They're all pretty much the same, but um, this is more or less uh, the checkoff list, list to uh, narrow down what strategy we're going to implement and what underlying in particular. One of the first things we need to make sure is that the underlying that we're looking at has a tight bid ask. Anything under $100 uh, a share, I usually say that the bid ask on the just out of the money uh, calls or puts should be within 10 cents of the bid ask. If it's a dollar fifty bid, it should be, you know, no more than a dollar sixty offer on that particular strike. So inside of 10 cents, the tighter is better. Uh, and it will allow you it, it, the, the wider those bid asks are, the more you have to give up to get in and get out, and that eats into your yield. So that makes it very difficult to be successful sometimes. Uh, I'm being asked, is there ever a successful method that is not predicted on the right underlying? Uh, if you could explain that a little bit more. Uh, I'll try and answer that here in a little bit. Um, so picking the right strikes. Now, this may seem a little weird because we're, you know, I talked about we're buying the ones in the money and the ones that are out of the money, and it's a pretty basic strategy. But what I want to convey here on picking the right strikes is that we collect as close to 50% the width of whatever the strikes are that we are picking. So if it's $5 wide, again, we want to collect $2.50. If it's $3 wide, we want to collect about a dollar fifty. So sometimes you will have to move around those uh, strikes a little bit in order to achieve that. Sometimes if you're picking, you know, the, uh, let's just say $2.50 wide strikes, that might not achieve that building that way uh, that strategy that way might not achieve a 50% width of the strikes. But if you went out to $5, let's say, you might very well be able to achieve that goal of the 50% the width of those strikes, collecting 50% the width of those strikes. So make sure you play around with it. That is the key to picking those strikes, is the collection. We want to make sure it's as close to that goal of 50%. Picking the right duration. Now, we are collecting a credit, so anytime you're collecting a credit, you really want theta decay to work in your favor. With this one, uh, we want theta decay to work in our favor, but we also want to give ourselves time to be right. We, uh, I was asked right before we went on here whether this was uh, appropriate for weeklies. It is. Um, you are giving yourself a little less time to be right, but in that, sometimes you are able to tighten those wings up uh, closer to the at the money in order to uh, give yourself the opportunity, you know, to be right on a smaller move. So keep that in mind. But I usually go with this strategy where we are looking at uh, just outside of this 35 day window right here in the 45 days is usually where I really like to do it and would default maybe even a little further out rather than to default on the inside. This is theta decay, and as you can see, inside of 35 days, it really starts picking up and decaying, and that's what we want to see uh, happening with our directional assumption of a bigger move happening. We don't want it to stay pinned at uh, the same strike as when we uh, built this strategy. Picking the right environment, this is one of those uh, IV percents where we are going to be looking for something less than 30. Uh, 15 to 30 is usually where I find the best scenario. Uh, 
Uh, I've actually been finding some that are in the teens and even in the single digits for IV percent. I'll go into that a little bit more when we start looking at the regular platform. I'll show you what the IV percent is and where to find that. Uh, I can even teach you guys how to, uh, to implement this with your, um, sorry, uh, it, where to find that and where to uh, do the math on it. Sorry, I got a bunch of qu people asking questions real quick. Uh, can you do this uh, before earnings? Absolutely you can uh, because we are going to want, um, you know, we, this actually works a little bit better with IV expanding. Um, if you were going to do it going into that event and and or expected a big move on that underlying from the uh, earnings, like if you think they're going to beat the uh, market maker move, then yes, uh, you could do that. I, I caution on that just because that volatility crush actually could really help you. And a lot of times, uh, especially this earnings season, we've had a lot of earnings land inside what the predicted move is. So be careful of that, uh, that your wings are probably going to end up being around where that market maker move is. And if it lands inside of that, that volatility crush and everything else, pinning it right there at that strike could hurt you. So uh, it is uh, one that you could do, but uh, I like to play earnings to land inside the market maker move because when volatility comes out uh, of those underlyings, you can make some good money. So I've done webinars on earnings specific. You can check that out, uh, Tovia uh, Pro Trader Strategy because those are some really good ones. And as a matter of fact, all through this earnings season, I went over uh, and and did really well with the earnings on those strategies. Um, are the short call and the short put strategy interchangeable? The short, uh, yeah, this is very, uh, very interchangeable with the short call butterfly. They do have a very similar risk uh, parameters. Uh, the, you're going to see when I show you an example here that the analyze tab, it is basically the same. The one thing that is better about the short put butterfly is anytime the market starts creating volatility, puts are usually affected more than the calls. So that will help you in this particular strategy. If volatility starts pumping up into these premiums, puts are usually affected more and get more premium, uh, more volatility in the put side than in the call side. So uh, in that regard, this is very similar, but this actually will, uh, have more, uh, the volatility will have a more of effect on the puts than the calls. Did that answer your question? Uh, any advantage over short call butterfly? Yeah, but I think I answered that, Marlon. This has the advantage over the short call butterfly because of the volatility component going into puts more often than into the calls. Uh, yeah, and uh, SC, it can be used as calls as well, and I did a webinar on that one last week. So, you know, another thing with the put butterfly, you know, you kind of want this to be more directionally to the downside because ultimately you would like all of your options to be out of the money. Get away from some of that assignment risk. So if you are slightly more bullish, then go with the call, short call butterfly to get those calls all out of the money, you know, the ones that are in the money have the assignment risk because uh, you can be assigned at any time. With the puts, maybe look at it for more of the downside, uh, uh, you're maybe more downside bias, but you still are expecting a big move in either direction. That makes sense to everybody. And knowing the exit strategy before we enter this trade. I talked about this in the call butterfly webinar. Also, we, this is a lower probability strategy. It's uh, sometimes hard to achieve the full uh, max profit potential on this because we have to wait so long uh, for all of these options to work themselves out. It really has to go into the last few days to be able to capture uh, a full 
uh, max profit on this. Just for one, the, the uh, legs are very uh, tight to one another. So uh, theta has a tendency to kind of negate uh, each other. And um, be, being that there's some that are in the money that theta decay doesn't happen as fast sometimes. So um, this I like to cover rather quickly, 25% of that max profit. So in a situation where we're talking about a $5 wide and we're trying to collect around $2.50, we are going to try and make about 65 cents on that strategy. So if we paid, or sorry, if we took a credit, excuse me, took a credit of $2.50, then we are going to, once it decays by 65 cents, that's when we're going to look to cover this. So at about $1.85, when our credit's back down to $1.85, that's where we're going to look to cover this strategy, right? Does that make sense? 25% of $2.50 that we collected at the onset, 25% uh, of that is about 65%. So you kind of subtract that out of uh, what we, what our credit is. All right, so like I said, max profit is that premium receipt, but again, it's a lower probability uh, strategy and takes a lot longer to uh, to have this completely work out all the way to the end. I don't like to do that because the closer you get to expiration, uh, the higher risk of assignment uh, there is. So keep that in mind. The longer you try and squeeze money out of this one, uh, the, you're increasing your risk of being assigned on that option that is in the money, okay? So, uh, like I said, max profit is that $2.50 that we collected, but we're going to only try and get about $0.65 cents out of that one. $3 wide uh, strategy, we are going to try and collect about $1.50. So, in that sense, we're going to be trying to get out when, um, when it's trading around $1.15. So, we collected $1.50. Five zero. That used to be the big uh, snafu on the floor was 50 versus 15, believe it or not. So um, there was a lot of errors created on that. Or a thousand versus a dozen. <laughs> so um, a lot of times I will say 50 and 1.5. So 1.5 means 15. So uh, you, if we collect it at $3 wide, so we collect $1.50 for that because that's 50%. 25% is where we're going to try and look to get out of that. So when it's trading at $1.15 or one five, that's where we're going to look to cover this strategy. Uh, it, good question. Uh, Farhad is asking, at what point would you close this strategy if it's not working out? One thing with this strategy is if it's not working out, that means it's kind of flatlined, right? It just hasn't gone anywhere. Um, a lot of times I'm going to, with this, because it's a defined risk strategy, I'm going to let it play out a little bit longer. And that's probably where I would uh, extend my duration uh, past my comfort zone. But, you know, if it's inside of uh, like 15 days to expiration, then I'm going to just look to cut my losses there and get out. Does that make sense? All right, so max loss on this is going to be the at the money put minus the, or sorry, the out of the money put minus the at the money put minus that premium we receive. So in our example, the uh, out of the money put is, let's say the 45 strike, our at the money put is the 50 strike. The difference is $5.00 minus that premium we received. So $2.50 in that regard would be our max loss. So really it's the, the width of the bit from the base to one of the wings and then subtract out the net premium received. All right, two break evens here, you guys, because we have the wings and it's really, uh, we're, implementing the strategy with a 
long put spread and a short put spread. So it's really two different uh, put spreads kind of put together, the at the money being the long and uh, the in the money being the long put spread, the uh, short put spread is the out of the money put with the second at the money put. So there's two different break evens if it goes up or if it goes down. Uh, one break even point is the at the money put plus the net premium or the out of the money put plus the net premium received. So in my example, the 45 uh, put 50 put and then we would have the in the money put being the 55 or yeah the 55 put um, the out of the money put plus the net premium so 45 strike plus the two dollars and fifty cents so when that underlying is trading at uh, forty seven dollars and fifty cents that would be our break even on the downside on the upside if the market were to rally it's the in the money put which is the 55 put minus that $2.50. So when it's trading it, the underlying is trading at $52.50, that would be our uh, break even on that side. And you also have to, yes, do take into consideration your uh, commissions on that also. But for simplicity reasons, that's the um, your net premium in really, in a sense, includes that uh, Yes. Uh, yes, this will be archived, Francis. Good questions. It will be ar archived. And when we're done with this, it gets sent out uh, to you guys that signed up for it in an email. And one thing I forgot to mention is please watch over this again because some of the nuances of this strategy will go flying by you. But the second time through, it will really solidify it, put it into your long-term memory, and uh, you know, you'll be able to implement it at a later date. Rather than going back a month later and re-watching it, you're literally going to be re-watching and re-learning everything again. All right, so this was an example I found on, um, on uh, what was it, AT&T. And the, uh, basically, it was trading right here at, uh, I thought the stock price showed up here on, I think it was trading at around, uh, 44 and change. It was really close to it. Um, I don't know why it's not showing on there. But anyway, so I picked the 44 strike, which was the one that was the at the money. And I used you start the strategy for the one that would um, be, could I give another example of, I'm about to, I think if this is what you're asking. So this is going to show all of it. So this is the example. Uh, we're buying two at the money puts the 44 strikes, the out of the money put is the 41 put and $3 higher from the at the money puts is the 47 strikes. So on this one, uh, I picked $3 wide. So here's another rule of thumb with this uh, strategy. Anything that is like less than uh, or right around $50 for it, um, this is correct, the analyze tab, analyze trade for the thinkorswim, yes. And so anything that's like around $50, that's usually my, my starting point for this butterfly is about $3 wide. If it's around $100, uh, you know, give or take, I'm probably going to go to 500 or sorry, $5 wide. If it is a, like a $500 stock, I'm probably going to be around $10 wide on the wings, okay? Um, Thing is, you know, lower price stocks have a tendency to move less, but same percentage wise, uh, you know, than the $500 stocks. They're going to be moving, you know, $10, $10 at a clip in some regards, especially like the Googles and the Amazons or, uh, um, you know, even when you even go higher with price lines, Chipotle, stuff like that. Those guys, you know, can move a lot. Uh, Francis, is that, are you expecting the stock to go up or down? Uh, the best way to answer that is yes, <laughs> because we don't really care with this strategy. If it goes up or down, we just want it to move, and we want it to move quickly. Because when we do this at inception, you can see our max loss on this strategy would be if 
the underlying pin right there at $44 uh, the whole time. That would be our max loss. And what I talked about, we're getting a credit of $1.68 here, as you can see. So our break-evens are going to be the $47 uh, minus that $1.68 or $1.70, let's say. And as you can see, that puts that right there at around uh, $45.30 for the break-even to the upside. So we need it to, to rally about $1.30 to get to our break-even. Uh, to the downside, similar situation. We take the 41 strike add in that credit to get to our break-even, and that puts us at $42.60. So if it goes down... Uh, that dollar uh, to do the 41 or $42.60, then that is our $42.68. That is our break even to the downside. And then as soon as it goes below the seven, uh, 41 strike to the downside, you know, that's going to be um, where we achieve our max profit. Uh, the other thing is, is if it goes above the 40, uh, seven strike that is going to be our max profit on the upside so we don't care if it goes up or down we just want it to really move you know preferably with this strategy like I mentioned you know we would like it to go down so that these uh, 47 puts go out of the money um, that way we don't have assignment risk or any of that happening um, so that would be a slight bias to it and as you can see the deltas are negative, albeit slightly, uh, with this one, which also gives you an indication as you would be slightly uh, bearish with this. And we want to do this in an implied volatility uh, range of somewhere uh, around 30%. We want to have the opportunity for volatility to go up. So no, we don't want to do this in super high implied volatility because when you have really high implied volatility, the probability is that volatility will come down. So uh, we would actually like this to see have volatility expand for us. It's a little bit counterintuitive than most strategies where you're doing a credit. Usually credit spreads, we want high implied volatility and have that volatility to come down. But because we're doing these, uh, buying these two strikes that are at the money, volatility affects the at the money strikes more than they do the ones that are deep in the money or uh, further out of money. Does that make sense? Why we would want to do this in a medium to low volatility environment? Jack? Uh, <clears throat> how many days before expiration do you like to close this before, to avoid assignment risk? Great question. Um, I don't like to go inside of 15 days to expiration for this particular strategy. I like to get out of it uh, before that happens, which is another reason why I'm willing to take less, less of my max profit potential. Max profit potential is two dollars, or in this sense, it's a dollar sixty-eight. So uh, you know, we would look at this like 25% of that dollar sixty-eight is. Uh, so what, 25, so 38, 38 cents. So when this goes down to $1.30, then that's when I'm going to be looking to cover it. Implement it at $1.68, cover it when it goes down to $1.30, and then I walk away. I would apply the same uh, mentality with uh, weeklies because they're going to decay rather quickly, but I would only... You know, it's a, like I said, lower probability trade, so I would try to get out of it rather quickly. I don't implement this a lot with the uh, weeklies, though, I, I will say. All right, um, so let's go, let's pull up the uh, platform. And this is usually about the time where I start asking people, you know, please throw out some, um, some, uh, trade recommendations, you know, some stocks that you guys like, and we'll go through the steps on it. See, for instance, like this only has IV percent of uh, 183. So this is that tight range that I'm talking about. You know, that's like that rubber band winding really tight. 
it's going to pop one way or the other. We just don't know which way at this point. So uh, that's what I kind of look for for this or something that, um, you know, is, is, is what I think ready for a big news event or something like that that could really move it up or down in either direction, maybe like a Twitter or something like that. Like if you think something's going to get taken over, like Twitter, it could make it really spike up or, you know, spike down. Um, so let's go to uh, this. In the, I probably still have this in the Analyze tab there. So um, one other thing with this, like I said, anything over $1.50 is gravy because we are risking less to make more. We're risking only $1.40 to make $1.60 in this regard. So anything over the top is great from that 50%. That is, uh, you know, makes it a green light as far as I'm concerned. All right, so uh, SPY, let's look at SPY. As you can see, I have some uh, long calls in there. And that's another thing. Please keep in mind some of these strategies, stocks, underlyings, everything I have in my account, uh, in my portfolio, uh, in several different of my portfolios. So I'm not trying to get you guys to do exactly what I'm doing. Um, I'm just telling you where I find them appropriate and it's kind of up to you guys. So this is what I was talking about with the tight bid ask. You know, you can see something like this. This is a $200 ETF and the bid ask is four cents wide. And a lot of times you will get it inside of, you know, uh, one to two cents wide even. It could be 29 bid at 30. So um, especially in something like this where, there is a lot of volume and open interest, uh, or sorry, volume and open interest here. Don't give up very much edge in these. Don't always just go to the mid price that this gives you and go with that. It uh, work these orders. If you don't have like two or three cancel replaces for every strategy you're trying to implement, then you guys are probably giving up too much edge and that's, you know, over time will eat into your profit. I mean, think about if you gained a couple of pennies every single trade that you implemented, what that would do over the course of 10 years. I mean, that would, that would be huge. All right, so at the money, so it's trading 218. The closest that at the money is this 218 uh, strike. So we are gonna want to buy two of those. So I usually build out every single strategy. I'm just kind of old school like that, I guess. I don't know. And I hold down the control button, add to it. You can see it added uh, two. And because it's over a uh, $100, I'm probably going to look at doing something that's $5 wide here. Um, we could Let's start out with $3 wide uh, if we can. So that would be that one. So I'm going to buy that one fifteen three dollars higher than eighteen is going to be the twenty uh, ones. So um, and I'm going to sell that one. So I sold, bought, sold. So I bought the two at the monies. I um, sold the one that is out of the uh, sorry the one that is in the money and the one that is out of the money and we got a fifty seven cent credit. So not very good. Uh, so we could try to increase that a little bit um, and go to the tw uh, 23s and go down to, to the 13s, right? Uh, 13 and 5, yeah, 5, so 3. Yeah, so dollar fifty six. it's, you know, it's a dollar off of our goal. So I'd probably uh, kick that one to the curb, um, especially because, look, I mean, you can see in your analyze tab, let me get rid of the, um, uh, why is it? Uh, let's get rid of that. Oh, and not that. So as you can see in this one, we're risking a lot more, you know, over $300 to make $156. So that's why I would not really do that. You just, I don't want to risk a lot more than I have the potential to make on this one, especially being a low probability.
All right. Does that make sense? All right. So uh, what else was there? Ruby? R-U-B-I? Does this type of trade show up on a monthly basis? Um, I probably will implement this strategy, uh, I would say, on average, probably uh, four times a year. It's not one of my favorite ones, for sure. But in this environment, there's it's very difficult to find high implied volatility uh, underlying. So if you look up here, I mean, you know, there is, I, I usually do credit. I like to collect credit for strategies. And usually in those strategies, I have a rule of it's got to be above 50 to do that. Well, you can see that there's not a whole lot up there. I mean, um, I have uh, restoration hardware in there, but that's only the only time I trade that one is during um, uh, earnings, really. That's the only time those markets get really tight. So this is a $9 stock, and if you look at this, these it's 15 cents wide, and then you go just in the money and it's 45 cents wide. Uh, that would probably be one that I would stay away from. Plus the lower, uh, the ones that are below $25 don't really work out very well with this one just because um, the dollar wide really take a long time to uh, work themselves out a lot of times. That makes sense. Uh, you know, uh, Laura, you asking how many uh, contracts do you normally take? That's up to you. This with this strategy, though, um, I if you're accustomed to doing one lots, this would be appropriate for a one lot. Uh, I wouldn't add to it or subtract to it. If you're accustomed to doing uh, 10 lots, then I would uh, implement this with the wings, 10 lots, 20 lots to the middle. So uh, it, it, I wouldn't shave it down for this strategy like I would for like naked options and things of that nature. All right, so does anybody else have any other ones? Um, one that uh, I'll just start pushing these out. Uh, yeah, like Pepsi. Pepsi usually has pretty good markets. Um, they have weeklies. Anytime they have weeklies, they uh, usually will have tight markets. You know, see a hundred dollar stock, two cents wide. Um, we also want to, you know, not a whole lot of volume in here, but there is a lot of open, uh, a lot of players in here. Um, so one other thing to look at is, you know, we want to look at our Vega and Thega. So, uh, so look here, you can see the ones that are at the money. You know, it's the closest that they at the monies have the highest Vega. So that's what I was talking about because we're buying those two uh, at the monies. Those are going to have the higher Vegas than the ones that are out of the money for the most part. Um, so for instance, so this is a hundred dollars st uh, stock. So we have five dollars wide anyway. So that's probably where I would start. So we want to buy those and sell, oh, did it not get the second one? 110 strike, because that's closest to sell one of those, sell the 115s. So we got $5 wide. It's close, and I might put it on the short list and continue to look for strategies. Uh, you could even look at the charts and see what it's been doing, you know, same thing, sideways. Uh, as a tendency to continue to go up, but you can see five dollars wide. Uh, you know, it when it's trending, that five dollars wide is pretty easily uh, attainable with that many days, right? Those from ninety-seven to one hundred, that's ten dollars. So you could easily see this just trend five dollars during the time that you've implemented it. So if it's a nice big trending way, that's that's good for us. All right, uh, HSY, so Hershey's, well, I don't even, I haven't looked at this stock in forever, what happened there, but yeah, it's trending like that. You could easily assume that it's going to, you know, trend upwards depending on what they did there. Um, 
it is a little overextended, but uh, let's look at it on this. So if you think it's going to have something like that move again, it's probably not likely, but you could see a lot of profit taking from all of these people that were just waiting to get paid. You know, we could easily see that come off, you know, $5 from 110 or even pop if they go through with whatever merger and acquisition they're looking at there. Um, so the trade, we're going to look at the closest at the money, 111, that makes the one tens the closest to that at the money and it has the highest baga. Usually that's another uh, default is to make sure that you're doing the one with the, buying the one with the highest baga. That will have a tendency to uh, allow this to work out. And one fifteens. So ninety three cents, but I'd, I'd pass on it just because it's not not even close there on that, right? To see, you can even have this. Like, look, we could even look at this on the analyze tab. Let's do this because um, I want to give you another example. There, there will be situations where you guys can look at this, and in some regards you're not getting any credit. You might be getting a nickel for $5 wide. Now that's just ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, you're re risking $4.95 to make $5. That just uh, does not make sense. So make sure you try and get that. Don't just blindly implement this strategy. Make sure you follow that main rule of uh, getting as close to 50% the width of the strikes as you can. So let's analyze this. See that? I mean, if you look at that, that's our break even. Look how far away our wings are. I, that's a lot of risk. Okay, so another one is disk. Image Entertainment. I don't know if I've ever even traded this one. Uh, they have no option. It says they have no options. Have you seen options on this one? GoPro. Let's move on to GoPro. Um, GoPro's got to do something, right? They just hired the guy from uh, design from Apple, the design guy from Apple. So um, 14 is probably the closest. So let's do, we're buying two of those. It might be difficult to get something on this one just because I'm going to go, uh, yeah, let's see what it looks like on a dollar wide. And so that, so 17 cents. See, these ones that get below $25 are usually very difficult to do it. Um, so we can try and widen it out if you really love it, but you know that you're increasing your risk or decreasing your probability of uh, profiting on this in some regard. So even when you go out that far, it's still not happening. So you definitely need a big one, big move. Tesla. Another one, you can check it out. Um, I don't want this. Okay, so Tesla, you know, another one. The Tesla is deceivingly wide. I mean, it's a $200 stock. You would think that they were as much volume and open interest as they would have. You would think that they would have um, a lot tighter market besides it. But the, these markets, we used to call it on the floor. Um, that we used to call this one on the floor that uh, they're in the weeds. And it may, basically means there's players in there and they're just waiting for somebody to, you know, just offer a couple of pennies below the offer, you know, like, so in this regard, they're just waiting for somebody to offer, uh, you know, 1120s or 1115s and they're going to buy them. So, uh, Keep that in mind, especially with like Tesla. Tesla gets a lot of trade. Uh, so just because these are so wide, this would be a, another example where you don't want to uh, step right in. And um, did I get two of those? Uh, 25s? No. So it's only 47 cents, but you can see the natural is negative $1.45 and the the uh, other side would be, you know, two dollars and uh, close to two dollars. So, in that, if you really wanted this, you know, you could put it in there for 
two dollars and forty seven cents and let it sit there and see if see if it works it out you know uh, I have no problem really doing that but just keep in mind getting out of that would be difficult and you might give up all your profit trying to get out so keep that in mind getting into that all right uh, it's there aren't really any predetermined scans to uh, to do this it's really pretty trial and error and I um, sometimes we'll go to the uh, this butterfly and then go through it you know you can see like and look at the asks the offer side um, and if that's close to it then you can kind of work with that doesn't always come up with very good prices though on that so uh, you took the short fly the uh, Verizon short call fly from last week little nervous yeah it's not moving around I took it too uh, we do need it to move a little bit but um, uh, that's that's the problem with that one is we we need to move uh, the analyze the Verizon trade uh, yeah what here as a matter of fact um, let's just go in here I put I think I put it in here so Verizon, we could it actually still holds true for Verizon right now that it it was so for some of you that weren't in on the webinar last week, Verizon uh, was one of those strategies that gave us over fifty percent the width of the strikes, gave us close to three dollars, and we did it as five dollars wide. So uh, let's just uh, see if I can put it in here. So. Uh, I in two of those. Sell on one of those. Sell on one of those. So it's still right there at the three dollars and forty cents because it hasn't moved. I mean, it just hasn't gone anywhere. It's gone down a little bit since last Friday, but we need more of a move. It's you know these strategies do take a while for it to to uh, work out. So if we can get Verizon to continue to go down, um, you know I. I, I like the bearish side of this anyway because you know a lot of people are like harping on them about buying Yahoo so uh, that that could push them down plus it's overextended to the upside so uh, it's going to want to go down here and and test this value area the value area high to my you know because this is where there's been a lot of volume and trading so I think that it's going to come down here and just trend down that way so I'm still I'm still on it I think it's gonna be good I mean it's trending our way we're getting that move I mean it's moved from what was last Friday the uh, 29th or something so we've got nothing but a sell-off since we did that from Monday 55 to 51 53 so yeah Now that's the one thing with these stra this strategy in particular is it does take it's, it takes a little bit longer for us to uh, to get paid on it. Um, Facebook's another one. God, I haven't looked at Facebook in quite a while. I... Oh, you're gonna work slow on me now. All right, so Facebook, yeah, so it's at a near term high. Everything is really. So let's look at Facebook then. Uh, it's got 3% IV. I mean, that's not going to scare us away. Uh, 25 is the closest to the at the money. Uh, we can look at it. It probably has the highest Vega as well. Um, yeah, it does. So we'll buy that two of those. So uh, $5 wide. Just in the money with the 30s. Okay, and we're getting a dollar, excuse me, we're getting a dollar 30 for five dollars wide. We need at least an extra dollar to get into that one. Uh, Goldman Sachs. Let's look at Goldman Sachs. Yeah, Goldman Sachs has moved. 
Um, you know, this actually might, you know, actually I have, I had a couple of bank stocks on here because I wanted to look at it. So um, let's go into a couple of examples that I know are good like that. So City um, was one that I vetted. And, you know, this was when I was looking at these yesterday going into today, they were like sideways and some of the economic data was coming out, the services, PMI, a lot of these uh, uh, PMI numbers are coming out a little bit better here and across the pond, which could uh, lead the uh, Fed to raise interest rates rather soon. So if they are going to raise interest rather soon, that's going to help out all these bank stocks because then they're going to be able to make more money on their on their interest. So or on, they're going to make more money on interest for like uh, home loans uh, and things like that. So that will increase their profit margins. So uh, and they, you know, financials got a big spike today because of the good unemployment data. All right. Having said that, then go into uh, city uh, five dollars wide. So right here. We're looking at the 45 strike. It's got 8% volatility, so it's not too high, right? It's very low. It's not going to go much lower than that. And we're going to look to buy two of these 45 puts, go $5 wide, sell the, oops, sell the uh, 40s and sell the 50s. Hopefully it does. So, yeah, we get over the $2.50, just slightly over $0.07 cents gravy, if you will. Um, so we're risking uh, less in that sense. And I think that, you know, these financials, I don't have any financials right now because um, I was bearish on the Fed. But if they're going to start looking like the Fed's going to raise rates, these guys are going to benefit from it. So they're going to start pushing higher. Uh, yeah, I did say between, you know, the sweet spot really is, uh, Far, uh, Farhad is asking, I thought you said IV. Uh, percent should be between 15 and 30 so it isn't city uh, not suitable that's just really the guide that I'm looking for because ultimately we want uh, IV to expand so I start with those um, because then if IV goes down we can still make money off the the uh, premiums going down uh, and that it allows that theta component to come out of these rather quickly so Yes, that is the sweet spot, the 30 to 15, because that actually will allow us to get out of this strategy quickly as that volatility contracts. When volatility contracts, it allows theta to come out, which is uh, the opponent of extrinsic value. That's what happens here. And that's what we would like to see to allow us to get out of the strategy rather quickly. Um, it doesn't always work out with those. These were some of them. But... If our ultimate goal is to have volatility expand to help us too, then having low implied volatility will work. Does that make sense? Yeah, you can scan for uh, implied volatility. Yes, I can't do it on this one, but um, yes, you can scan for implied volatility, but that I don't think you can scan for a butterfly like to parameters on that butterfly so this the I think that the uh, the banks could get a big move you know again if we get bad economic data these after seeing this good economic data and these guys are benefiting from uh, the, the uh, speculation that interest rates are going to rise they're going to make more money so they're looking like their margins are going to increase that's good. Then all of a sudden we get a bad economic data and basically everybody's going to take all that premium out of the stock and it could slam down. So this could be a great strategy around uh, this one. I also looked at JP, Mor uh, JP Morgan. It also has um, <clears throat> in line with uh, the 50% width of the strikes also. So that could be another one to look at. Um, all right. So... That's about all I have for these. I, I'm going to look to implement a couple of these on Monday so you can uh, watch the daily market commentaries. I you know, highly suggest you guys watch those because I, I go through and talk about uh, the trials and tribulations of trading on a daily bit basis, what I'm implementing and, and why I'm implementing those. So uh, go, check those out. And 
Um, one thing is uh, for like earnings trades and stuff like that, uh, you can follow me at Wolfman's blog on Twitter. Uh, I tweet out a lot of stuff there. Sometimes it's not even all market related. I have snarky comments, but Twitter at Wolfman's blog. You can also follow uh, Pro Trader Strategies at Pro Trader Strat. Uh, they uh, we throw out a lot of stuff about market relation, uh, market things in, in that nature, and special offers when they come about. So you can check that out. Um, uh, England put up the kibosh on interest rates. You're slashing. Uh, yeah, I know. I don't know what there goes. Those guys are going to do helicopter money, um, most likely. So if you guys ever uh, on the floor, what we used to always say. Uh, if there's blood in the water, that's the best time to go fishing. That's the way we look at it for IV. And, you know, you've heard how much did I talk about implied volatility today. I mean, it's literally top of mind awareness for any trader, for that matter. It is the most important thing to understand as far as I'm concerned, you guys. Um, as a matter of fact, I built a whole course around it. We're offering this again for those of you who... Uh, we're participants in this webinar. Uh, th this is how important I think it is. It's like, I think it is the utmost important thing to understand when dealing with options than anything else, even more than like Delta, any of the other Greeks. Uh, this is the most important thing to understand. And when I talk about blood in the water, that means when everybody else is panicking, uh, you know, and, and, and they think there's sharks in the water, that's the time to go fishing because that's where there's activity and that's the time to sell premiums because then when everybody's done panicking, uh, all of that premium comes out and we call it, we used to call it the volatility crush on the floor and that's when the volatility just snaps straight down and all the premium comes out. Volatility actually has a tendency to even hold up theta decay. So like that one slope that I showed you, sometimes it'll flatten out even longer because volatility is increasing. It kind of is like the air in the balloon pumping it up. And, you know, as that balloon gets bigger and bigger with volatility, you let go of that balloon and it's like, and it just rips all around and snaps all the air out of there. It's basically done. I mean, as floor traders, you guys, we used to have meetings before and after the close and all we would talk about was what volatility did during the day and what we expected it to do going in the future. You know, even even the grain traders were concerned about volatility. You know, when it rains, you know, that would basically increase volatility sometimes. So everybody was even talking about that in meetings before and after. That would be like for a half an hour to an hour in some some cases. And uh you know, people trading for a long time, you know, when, when they're talking about trading, they're almost exclusively talking about volatility and what it's done to the premiums. As a matter of fact, uh, there are a lot of options traders, myself included, are more concerned about volatility than even direction. It is that important. I, I mean, I would rather see volatility or know what volatility or feel what volatility is going to do over direction almost any day. Uh, so that's how important it is. It is more important than understanding the direction of the market. Uh, you know, a lot of people take charting classes and stuff like that. Those are great, but understanding volatility in my eyes is more important than that because uh, you have to know what the direction of the market's going to do to volatility in that case. So, um, and I talk about all of that stuff in this uh, course that we're giving you guys 50% off. I talked about this the last time. You know, I, I did two, uh, a, a couple, of, actually even just the last couple of uh, uh, earnings trades on volat that I did surrounding volatility crush. Basically paid, would pay for this uh, course. And those are on, on one lot. So, you know, if you can learn it, you can take advantage of it immediately. It's going to pay itself off, you know, really quickly. And all of these different courses are in there, plus a bunch more. Uh, you get the daily market commentaries, like I said, where I, I talk about on a daily basis as to what's going on, um, when you should be selling 
options premium, when you should be buying options premium, kind of like what I talked about with this short put butterfly, despite the fact that uh, we are collecting a credit, we want volatility to expand. I talk about all of those things in this volatility crush course in that regard. And I also give you guys some trader hacks from the floor as to uh, easy ways to determine what volatility is going to do. You can see in the future what volatility is going to do. Uh, so take advantage of that. It is, I, I, I just can't explain or it, emphasize, I should say, enough how important but to understanding volatility is like the back of your hand, you guys. And uh, you can talk to Tycho. He's going to be at the office uh, doing the phone calls. Uh, he was with me on the floor. Uh, I know him from way back. He knows as much about uh, options as well. So he will be able to answer just about every one of your questions. If you can't answer those questions, he'll send you over to me um, and I can answer those. Oh, one other thing with this, you guys, you guys get access to me as well. If you guys sign up for this, uh, you guys or any of my courses, reach out to me. If you have a problem where um, I can't remember who it was that said that they took on the, the uh, Verizon uh, trade that we did last time, reach out to me. You know, I, I will be happy to talk you through that one-on-one, -on -one, what I'm uh, doing with that strategy, how I'm feeling about it. Uh, you know, so please take advantage of that, you guys. Uh, th th that's like a mentorship for, you know, options. I'll talk to talk you through all of it. Um, uh, why are we selling butterflies that collect a credit? <laughs> Rob's asking, why were we selling butterflies? Because we I like, I like collecting money. I don't like paying it out and I uh, feel like I've been buying too many options lately because of the low implied volatility environment. But um, back to this, uh, we also get the, uh, I talked to you about how you determine what the IV percent is so you can figure it out on your own because sometimes IV percent is uh, artificially low in a sense because there's an anomaly in volatility. Like, for instance, last year in August when we had that huge sell-off, you know, that kind of threw off volatility for the rest of the year because that was being added into the equation. And I, I show you the equation and how to figure all of that stuff out. So um, it is well worth the money, especially at the 50% discounted price. So please, guys, take advantage of that. I can't emphasize it enough. Uh, if you don't do anything else other than learn volatility, uh, you know, I would be happy because I think that you would be well on your way uh, to success. But I also have other courses out there, too, talking about earnings trades and everything else. So check those out. There's a lot more classes in there than just this. Tycho will tell you all about it. Um, and uh, take advantage of it for sure. Uh, that's about all I got for you guys today. If you can't take that, Take it easy. Um, I'll answer a couple of your guys' questions here in just a sec. Oh, yeah, I don't know if I messed that up. Anyway, so a couple of the questions going on here. Um, remember all, uh, so uh, unfortunately missed the first half. Is this recording available? Yes, Bill, this was recorded. Um, the other thing was, uh, does historical volatility impact, impact uh, implied volatility. No, they're different. Um, they, they are all based on volatility. Uh, if you notice on some of those charts that I had, the uh, I do have historical volatility on there. I don't really look at it. But um, the implied volatility uh, percent, in a sense, is where it is where implied volatility is now. Uh, in a percent form as to where it's been. So if it's in the upper half of its normal uh, volatility, you know, so if it's at the higher end at 100% volatility, that means current implied volatility is at the highest it's been. And it implies, you know, uh, that percentage you expect to revert back to the mean in a sense. So that's what we talk about in that uh, volatility course also. Uh, how is selling the butterfly better than selling a vertical? 
Um, it, it, the problem with a vertical right now, selling a vertical spread right now, Rob, great question, uh, is that we have such low implied volatility that if we get that expansion in volatility, that's going to hurt us. Um, and <clears throat> you could even be directionally right, but get that expansion in volatility. Say you sold a, uh, a uh, put vertical or even a call vertical and we get expansion and volatility, that's going to hurt us. We could even be directionally right in some regards and sometimes still lose money on that if you get a massive expansion in volatility. Say you sold something at, um, you know, a, you know, 5% implied volatility and it expands to 100%. You legitimately could still be out of the money with those uh, that call vertical or put vertical and because of that expansion of volatility, you would lose money. So with this one, this is better for a, a lower implied volatility or lower volatility environment because then that expansion in volatility actually will help us out. Does that answer your question, Rob? Good question though. <coughs> Excuse me. Does anybody else have any other questions before we take off? All right. Well, uh, you're not worried about the expanding by, uh, IV. If the direction is right, the expanded IV creates higher theta, and that is true. But um, it it does create higher theta, but also expansion in IV holds off that theta for a longer period of time. All right, guys, thank you very much. Have a great weekend, everybody. I appreciate everybody participating. I love the back and forth. Take care, guys.